Pancake, everyone. Who do you imagine when we say the words maniac or killer? Perhaps it will be someone from movies or TV shows like Dexter or maybe Hannibal Lecter. Or someone from real-life murderers like Dahmer, Chikatilo or John Wayne Gacy. Notice something? In most cases, it's indeed a man. That's why we have compiled a list of stories about completely different women who faced harsh punishment for their crimes. Pour yourself a cup of tea and let's get started. Creators are always inspired by other creators, even if the person can't do anything but commit evil. Remember Mark David Chapman, who, after reading The Catcher in the Rye, went on to shoot former Beatle John Lennon. It seems that the same happened with Irina Gaidamchuk, who in the best traditions of Dostoevsky killed elderly women aged 60 to 90 with a hammer. Not just one or two, but a total of 17 victims on the skirt-wearing Raskolnikov's record. Rodion had a monetary motive. But what was Irina's motive? We'll find out soon. Year 2002. A small town in the Sverdlovsk region is shaken by the news of brutal murders of pensioners. Nine victims were bludgeoned to death with a hammer in their own apartments. Initially, the investigation suspected robbery as the motive, since money and jewelry were missing from the houses. But the identity of the killer, whether it was a man or a woman, remained a mystery. However, in 2003, Irina revealed herself when she attempted to eliminate a new victim not with her usual hammer, but with a knife. Posing as a social worker, Irina struck the pensioner with a knife as soon as the door opened. However, due to her inexperience, she failed to finish the job. The old woman screamed, neighbors rushed in at the noise, and the killer had to retreat. The outcome of this episode was the creation of a composite sketch and suspicion cast on all blonde women in the area. Perhaps fearing capture, the killer switched to nearby cities in the region, where she could travel by train. She carried out her dark deeds in Serov, Archit, and even Ekaterinburg. It took investigators eight years to catch Irina. Yes, she hid and changed the appearance well, but don't let this cunning deceive you. In 2010, Irina was charged based on fingerprints left near some of the victims. Are you curious about the amount of money that drove Gaidamchuk to commit these atrocities? Oh yes, we have that information too. It wasn't millions or even a hundred thousand. For robbing all these old women, Irina received a pitiful 50,000 rubles. In June 2012, Irina Gaidamchuk was sentenced to the maximum possible punishment, namely 20 years of imprisonment. A psychiatric examination deemed her sane. It's horrifying, but this is just the beginning. As we discussed in the video about the Mafia, which you can watch on our channel, sometimes a woman can become the leader of an entire criminal clan if her husband is killed, for example. This is what happened to Maria Licciardi, who took over the Neapolitan clan after her husband's death and the arrest of his brothers. Of course, her rise to power was not smooth. There were several attempts to seize control of the clan, and they were quite bloody. However, Maria managed to maintain control and even expand the clan's influence through alliances. Under her leadership, the criminal activities of the organization became more cunning and less noticeable to law enforcement agencies. Drug trafficking, extortion and prostitution were just a small part of what this mafia family was involved in. But their prosperity couldn't last forever. First, there were victims among the drug users, and then they became involved in the bloody turf wars, in which approximately 120 people lost their lives. Maria was listed as one of the top 30 targets for Italian law enforcement agencies, and she was soon arrested. Her first term as the godmother of the clan lasted almost nine years, after which she was released. And even from prison, Maria continued to run the Mafia's affairs. As you may have already understood, only the grave can correct this hunchbacked path. She evaded the police for a long time, but in August 2021, the newspapers were filled with headlines about the arrest of a 70-year-old Maria Lichardi. She was tried as the head of a criminal organization and, along with 30 subordinates, sentenced to 20 years in prison, which, considering her age, is practically a life sentence. But there is one person who definitely received a life sentence, and that is Melissa Calderon Ojeda, also known as La China. While our previous heroine made her clan smarter and less noticeable, this lady, after coming to power in 2008, went on a rampage. La China's signature became the abduction and dismemberment of her enemies. Afterward, the bandits would send different body parts of the victims to their relatives, along with instructional notes. During her seven-year reign, the Mexican drug cartel Damaso increased the number of bloody executions of their enemies by more than three times. 
and when the former head of the cartel was released from prison in 2015 and sidelined Melissa. She wasted no time in assembling her own gang, whose brutality demonstrated that La China meant business. The clashes between the gangs turned into a bloody massacre, pushing La China's paranoia and cruelty to the maximum. Wherever she appeared, it always ended in killings and dismemberments. It got to the point where her lover, with whom she organized her gang, couldn't bear it anymore and, fearing for his life, he turned Melissa over to the police. She was charged with involvement in 150 murders plus drug trafficking. And in Melissa's case, plus is the key word because in Mexico all sentences for all crimes are cumulative. Thus, she received a sentence of 893 years in prison. And the next story will be about a great hypocrisy that lasted for 33 years. It started during the Great Patriotic War, 1942. At the age of 22, Antonina Parfonova had already been to the front, she was taken prisoner, and she escaped from captivity. She wandered with her companion in the forests until they reached this hometown. There Tanya languished in idleness and occasionally engaged in prostitution until she was driven away. So Tanya ended up in the Nazi-occupied village of Lokot, where she continued to sell her body until collaborators offered her housing and food in exchange for work, executing prisoners. Antonina agreed and immediately received a machine gun. The first time she might have had a drink to master courage. But alcohol was no longer needed the second time. Tonka the machine gunner executed prisoners three times a day with groups of 27 people sent her as victims. Later, researchers estimated that she was responsible for a total of one and a half thousand murders. On September 5, 1943, Lockett was liberated by the Red Army. Antonina, on the other hand, found herself in a Polish concentration camp, from which she was liberated in 1945. Posing as a nurse at a Soviet military hospital named Makarova, using stolen documents, she escaped punishment. After that, everything was simple. She got married, changed her last name again to Ginsburg, gave birth to daughters, found a job at a factory, and enjoyed all the respect and privileges that were due to war veterans. But the authorities didn't forget about her. As soon as Lockett was liberated, the investigators began searching for the bloodthirsty Tonka the machine gunner. Thirty years and random set of circumstances led to the interest of the KGB in Antonina Ginsburg. When she was arrested, Tonka the machine gunner was calm. So much time had passed, and she was counting an amnesty. But it was not to be. In 1979, Antonina Ginsburg was executed for the proven murders of 152 people. Now, our next heroine may not impress with the number of victims, but her love for her son turned out to be truly deadly. Louis Smith was 41 years old when she believed that her son Greg's former lover wanted to harm her little boy. After luring Cindy, Louis subjected her to a relentless interrogation. Cindy, of course, denied everything. But Louis didn't believe her and started choking her. But it wasn't enough, so she slashed Cindy's throat with a knife. The girl was still alive when Louis brought her to her ex-husband's house. The man and his current wife even caught Louis and Greg's arrival, but soon left going about their business. Thus, the torture for Cindy continued without unnecessary witnesses. She was tied to a chair with an open back for easier beating, and they shot at her. While Greg was reloading the pistol, Louis jumped on Cindy's head and neck. All of this was done with laughter. After that, Louis shot Cindy four times in the chest and twice in the back of the head. As a result, she died. Later at the trial, Louis convinced the prosecutors that all the blame lay on her and that her son was not guilty. The court believed her. It was only because of this that Greg was not sentenced to death, unlike his mother, and was given a life sentence. Louis, on the other hand, was executed by lethal injection. She was 61 years old. By the way, Louis had the nickname Wicked Nadine in school, which journalists often used when writing about this case. Now, the next story not only made front-page news, but also received an Oscar, or rather its film adaptation. The story of Alien Warness is a series of violent suicide attempts and exchanging sex for money, cigarettes, drugs or food. And of course prison sentences for riots and robberies. She was kicked out of her home at 15, and at 14 she gave birth to a child conceived through rape. Since the age of 11, she sold herself. All this instability eventually led her to those infamous 12 months when, from 1989 to 1990, she killed seven men with firearms. Initially, Aileen claimed that she acted in self-defense, that the men were trying to rape her. The scheme was roughly as follows. The men would hire Aileen as a prostitute. 
They would drive to a secluded place, often in the woods, where she would shoot them, take their money and sometimes their cars, and leave their bodies to rot. During the trial, Ellen eventually confessed that she only acted in self-defense in the case of the first victim, Richard Mallory, previously convicted of sexual offenses. She received her first death sentence for the murder of Richard in 1992. By 1996, despite a psychiatric evaluation that found Ellen mentally ill due to her diagnosed borderline personality disorder, the court sentenced Warnes to six death penalties, one for each murder case. However, one body was never found, so no sentence was imposed for that victim. After many years on death row, in 2002, 46-year-old Ellen Warnes was given a lethal injection. Before that, in her final statement, she promised to come back to this world with Jesus. Our next story may horrify even hardcore true crime enthusiasts, and that's because it involves a girl named Mary Bell, who at the age of 11 was tried for the murder of two boys. Yes, the British judicial system allows children who have committed serious crimes to be prosecuted. And Mary ended up in the defendant's dock. But what exactly happened? When Mary was in school, she would attack her classmates and attempt to strangle them. After several such attempts, the other children started avoiding her, and Mary apparently realized that for her dark deeds she would have to find someone younger and weaker. And she did. First she strangled four-year-old Martin Brown, and two months later, three-year-old Brian Ho. In the first case, the police found no evidence other than signs of strangulation, but with the second boy. They tortured him with broken scissors. It was those scissors not the carved letter M on her chest that became the clue to capturing Mary. During questioning, in an attempt to confuse the investigation, she mentioned a boy she had seen with broken scissors. But no one except the police and the killer could have known about the scissors. The press was not informed about it. But what is alarming is not just the cruelty with which the girl dealt with her victims, but the open delight she felt towards the parents of the victims. For example, Mary and her friend Norma went to Martin Brown's house before the funeral and asked to see him. Martin's mother replied that it was impossible because he was dead. To which Mary, without a trace of remorse or sympathy, replied, Yes, I know. I just wanted to see him in the coffin. And during Brian Ho's funeral, the detective in charge of the case noticed Mary standing near the family's house. Later, he recounted that the girl was laughing at that moment. Mary was not the first child of Betty Bell an underage and mentally unstable prostitute. Relatives recounted that the mother had attempted to get rid of the child several times, both during pregnancy and after childbirth, by throwing Mary off the first floor or feeding her sleeping pills. According to Mary herself, she had been subjected to sexual violence since the age of four. Therefore, despite her statement in court that she killed for pleasure, the judge interpreted the crime as unintentional with mitigating circumstances. Verdict? Indefinite imprisonment which is interpreted as life imprisonment in some articles about Mary. In reality, the authorities in the United Kingdom could release Mary from prison at any time, once it is determined that she no longer poses a threat to society. And that's what happened. After 12 years of imprisonment, 23-year-old Mary Bell was released in 1980, and to this day she lives in the UK under a fictional name and with updated documents. The anonymity program, according to a court decision, applies both to her daughter and granddaughter permanently. These are the stories we have today. Statistics on murders and statistics on serial killers indicate that women are involved in such cases significantly less. Perhaps it is because of this rarity that life sentences or death penalties for women provoke greater protests in various societies. Female cruelty doesn't just shock us without reason. We hope you have learned something new today. Something that you can surprise your friends with during your next conversation. And now we are off to make a new video. See you soon!